Okay, so first of all, I need to uh, thank Nicholas Cook for uh, very kindly allowing me to come and talk to you today. I also want to thank David Smith, who gave me some very, very well appreciated advice on uh, styles, uh, because really, I'm not going to talk too extensively about styles, but I'm just going to really talk about how uh, we, um, as we move into gin um, as novices, how we actually start to navigate uh, the landscape of gin and, and what is important in terms of education provision uh, outside. And actually, uh, having undertaken some of the education provision myself, uh, what, what actually is being delivered so that you're aware uh, of, of what's being said. So um, uh, really, I'm just going to start a little bit on, on a tour of styles. It, it is uh, coming as a brewer as I am. I'm, a, I'm the group chief brewer from SAB Miller. Um, I'm responsible for uh, the technical aspects of 220 uh, main beer brands. These are huge brands um, and a whole raft of, of local brands. And we also, as part of an acquisition, um, acquired uh, a couple of distilleries, uh, which started me on this process of needing to uh, know a little bit more about distilled spirits, and gin is just one part of that portfolio. Um, so uh, if we actually look at the raft of different beer styles, when you first start to enter into uh, the area of gin, it's actually quite difficult to navigate it. One of the reasons why it's very difficult to navigate it is when these styles are talked about in various different uh, books and literature, you get the legislative uh, elements, which are very, very clear, and they're available on several different um, uh, websites, uh, and, and that's very important. But what you don't get is really the connectivity between the different styles and, and why they are actually there. So you have to dig a little deeper. And some of the styles have geographical constraints. And uh, actually, as you read about these different styles, one of the interesting things about it is that this, what you might be reading today may actually not still be valid. Uh, so a very good example of this is, is actually the Plymouth Gin, which in the last 12 months uh, no longer has that historical connection of a geographical need to produce Plymouth Gin in Plymouth, as I understand it. So um, not only do you have the geographical constraints, but then you also have uh, production style prerequisites. So these are more closely linked to the legislative areas, but they are actually very important demarcations, which I can honestly say that uh, aren't always very clear to consumers. Um, and I'll come on to why I say that uh, perhaps a little later. And then finally, uh, you have raw material derived styles. And as we heard today from Charles, that was a fantastic demonstration of the range of different flavor attributes that you can get and aroma that you can get from neutral grain spirit. But of course, uh, historically and more generally, um, there are two types of styles that are associated with different raw materials. They are markedly different from the types of gin that we've been talking about today. And uh, as we'll see a little bit later, uh, these nuanced differences of the raw materials for a neutral grain spirit, but also, for example, certain aspects of uh, the juniper, juniper cones and berries that you might buy, these are also have a real impact. Um, and then you also have styles that belong to phylogeny. And it, from a beer context, we use this quite a lot, where we actually look at the ancestry of beer styles, how they've evolved over time and what the connectivity actually looks like. And so in the same way uh, as we have in beer, in gin, you have a very, very rich heritage, which means that you can actually look at that phylogeny, that historical evolution of beer styles and understand the connectedness, which is really extremely important. And then finally, uh, you have styles uh, that are <coughs> developed for particular segments, which are really around um, a particular need. It might be uh, uh, an ABV need, so an alcohol by volume need, or it may be some other segment uh, differentiation that occurs. And then, of course, right at the bottom there, you have the unconstrained styles, which is where there is a whole raft of opportunity uh, for uh, various different uh, distilleries to really start exploring novel botanicals, novel consumer experiences. So this is, this is the kind of navigation frame in which gin is sitting. And, and I, I would say that um, uh, these kinds of uh, understanding of the connectivity of the different styles probably doesn't come across 
in all of the education programmes. So you really have to read around the subject in order to really understand it properly. Um, so for styles to grow, they must provide a very consistent consumer experience, and this means quality. And it means quality at every step of the pathway. Um, actually, in reality, you could, and this is only uh, you know, um, um, my way of uh, defining it, I'm not proposing it, but you could actually say that a gin uh, that is a quality gin, and I'm not talking about premium versus non-premium, but a quality gin is responsibly produced using appropriately sourced and wholesome ingredients, consistent production techniques, and good manufacturing practices that exhibit flavor characteristics that are consistently aligned with that which the consumer would expect to see, but also that which the distiller would expect to see. Actually, uh, this uh, particular um, a set of words is very much based on, on how we would uh, define uh, beer. And really all we've done here, or all I've done here, is, is take beer, uh, the, that beer definition, and apply it to gin and see if it makes sense. So I would love feedback um, in the lunchtime from you as to whether or not that uh, actually starts to reflect what you see in terms of quality. Remember, that's not premium. That really is quality. So if, if that is the right way to frame the quality of gin, then the next stage is actually to have an organized system in which you can place that quality. And this is really very important. Um, we know from our experiences in brewing that uh, making sure, for example, that we have appropriate standards and specifications for our ingredients and our processes are absolutely key, and also for our products. So an organised system of quality is, is really quite important and it allows you to put some policies in place. Your policies might be that you will sustainably source ingredients or maybe that they will be locally sourced as an example of a kind of a policy that you may uh, choose to adopt as a distillery. And your principles are the sort of def definition of all the aspirations you want your distillery and your brands to assign to and then obviously you would need to set up the frame of how you plan to meet them. So let's talk first of all about raw materials because I think this is such an important space and one of my remits um, is actually to look after our raw material portfolio um, at SAB Miller. And really one of the things that we do right up front whenever we're using a new hop variety for example is we actually set the specifications of that ingredient. So specification setting is absolutely critical. It does several things for you. It provides you with protection but it also assures that the raw materials that you're using are always the ones that you actually intended to purchase and that you actually have some form of yardstick to be able to assure that over time those don't change. So you'll choose an attribute, it might be a particular flavour attribute that you want to have or it actually might be uh, some other um, uh, compound attrib attribute that you're looking for. You'll put a metric aside that, a unit and a value. And usually <laughs> you'll put a range. So you'll put a lower limit, an optimal limit, and a higher limit. And that actually allows you to, to really have good conversations with suppliers about what it is you would like to receive from them. And you should be actually part of the setting of that specification. Um, that's very important. Uh, let me give you an example. Now remember that I come from brewing, but I just want to give the example uh, of Juniper to you and tell you a little bit about some of the science that sits under, underneath Juniper. And I know we're going to talk about this in some of the tastings, so I'm not going to steal anyone's thunder from later on. But obviously there are over 50 different species of, of Juniperus, and uh, really most gins are, are actually made from uh, the one which is Juniperus communis, and um, there's lots of good reasons for that. Um, there are some Junipers that you wouldn't want to use because they don't produce the right flavour attributes, and others that are actually quite difficult to secure on a sustainable manner. So actually, this is a very good um, starting point. And within this particular starting point, you've got three areas of variability. So I'm not going to talk about how you differentiate, but much more about if you're wanting to look for the same level of flavour, for example, then what is it that you should really think about? The first thing is the geographical location of the terroir. Now, I'm not going to talk more about that because uh, we're going to have a tasting on that, and I don't want to uh, influence anything to do with that because you'll, you'll see that for yourself. The terroir is the geographical location where the uh, original juniper was sourced, and that has a, a really quite a uh, big impact. 
The second is seasonal. A publication came out in 2014 which actually identified, and this used um, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, spectroscopy, not something you would find typically uh, in, a, in a distillery. But what it did is it extracted all of the chemicals and compounds from the juniper berries that were actually harvested <laughs> at different seasons and actually understood what all of those were. Now, there are literally thousands of different compounds. And um, the chart is very small, um, and it just gives you an indication of the variability. Actually, what it really says uh, different sugars that are present in the juniper. But in this study, they also looked at flavours. They chose not to publish that bit yet. So I would look out for those, that publication because I think it's going to be very important. <coughs> but what you see here is these are different sugars. And basically, each of these is uh, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And of course, we have to remember that the juniper berries um, mature over up to a 36-month period. And so therefore, in different seasons, you will actually get different uh, chemistry within the juniper barriers as you move through the seasons. So it's actually quite important uh, to understand where your juniper is coming from, what season it was harvested in, and what the level of matur uh, maturation was for that particular berry. And remember that, as shown on this photograph, the juniper berry doesn't know that we want it to be very consistent with respect to the flavors that we would associate with gin. It's not, it's not growing for that particular purpose. And so therefore, you know, that, that, that variability that you can see is really quite important. Um, in juniper, there have been a few studies which have demonstrated that there are a whole raft of different flavor compounds that are associated with juniper. And 77 of these flavor <coughs> compounds represent 80% of the typical flavors that you would see in gin associated uh, with that juniper-like character. So that's quite a lot of variability that you could theoretically get. And so therefore, there are a raft of different techniques that you can use in order to be able to establish whether or not the flavor and chemical profile that you're looking for is similar uh, from one source of juniper to another, and then understand what that might mean to you in terms of um, your flavor differentiation for your product. Now, you don't have to do that, but what you could do is you could actually assign attributes that you want to see in your juniper from your suppliers. And that's the way in which we typically approach the, these kinds of scenarios. So you've got to manage botanical variation. It's, it's a given. It, it's going to happen, and because you're dealing <laughs> with an agricultural product. And it's very important that you predict availability and pricing, because actually these can change depending on who else is sourcing uh, these scenarios. Let me give you an example from brewing. And there are lots of aroma hops that are being sourced by lots of different breweries, particularly in the craft segment. And actually, that means that from time to time, we find that there are actually shortages of given varieties of hop. And exactly the same could actually happen with botanicals. Uh, it also allows us to predict trends in quality and provide ourselves with alternative sourcing strategies. So if something goes wrong, where else are we going to get uh, a juniper of the required quality and character that we're looking for. And it also gives us opportunities for new product development because if we find something very interesting and different, well, then there's an opportunity right there to explore an innovation cycle. So once you understood what it is what, what, that you want from your raw material, the next piece is really to understand what it is you want from your supplier. That's also very important. And you need to accredit your supplier and build relationships with them. If you give them a specification, they have to meet that specification. So those are the kinds of conversations that are really very key. And then, obviously, in order to make sure that you have a consistent product that both the distiller and the consumer will recognize, you have to get a very nice interplay between the kinds of standard operating practices that you would deploy to make that particular brand of gin. And What's more, it's very important that where you find that there is something you want to drive in terms of strategy, maybe you want to reduce the amount of energy you're using across your process, that you develop appropriate key performance indicators. These are uh, a set of goals and strategies that you and your company want to deliver against. And usually there are a very small number of goals and strategies. And you identify where in the process you can measure whatever it is you're trying to target or improve. Maybe you want to extract more flavor uh, from parts of your maceration process or your distilling process. 
that to understand that that is the goal that you want, you can set targets and set measurement points and actually be able to start to drive towards an improvement plan, which is really, really quite key. Um, you might have heard of the words quality control and quality assurance. They are actually quite different things. Um, quality control is really focused on the product itself. It's about saying, is the product exactly what I expected it to be? Does it meet all the chemical and flavour uh, aspirations? And then quality assurance is saying, okay, where do things go wrong in the process? And what tests can I put in there early enough in order to be able to identify the problem, rectify it, not meaning to pardon, <laughs> solve for it, maybe is a better way uh, to say it, solve for it before I reach the product stage. And so this is, a, this is called quality assurance. And the balance between these two is really important in making sure that you have a great quality product. Now, of course, when you have a great quality product, you need to have some kind of product specification that sits around it. And some of this will be chemical, but a lot of it will be sensorial. So you have to have the right sensory tests in place. Um, let me take you through some of the sensorial needs that you will have. Obviously, nose, taste, colour, clarity, pack quality, something that's very often actually missed. Um, is, is the pack consistent? And then you need a really good taste system. And what we do for taste systems in, in all of our different categories is we have two different types predominantly. The first is a basic fault detection system. And the second is an advanced system which enables us to understand what the flavour profile of our product should look like and then allow us to test trueness to type, trueness to the brand profile and what we were expecting. Now, in order to get yourself a taste system that's appropriate, you really need to uh, work with a, an appropriate uh, company that will do that. We obviously don't do that. We do do that, uh, but we work with external providers in order to be able to help us to get to this place where we can deliver these sensorial attributes. So you need the two, and they're very, very powerful. It means that once you have a standard way of tasting, it actually allows you to be really quite good at making sure that consistency stops being quite so variable and starts coming down. And that's particularly important when you're actually increasing your volume. Um, so all of these things require people with talent and skills. And as I was finding, because I'm, I'm, I'm a brewer and I'm qualified in all things brewing, which is wonderful, however, Actually, when you're f suddenly faced with shifting into a distilling arena, you, you need to start learning very quickly about this new language and this new way of working. And so um, looking at the way in which different distilling, distilling qualifications <laughs> work, I just want to navigate you through some of them because I think it's quite interesting to do that. So in some cases, I know there are companies that have botanists or herbologists as part of their team. That's an excellent thing to have. But actually, if you wanted to train someone in this technique, it's really very difficult to do it. If you do a search for different courses in this area, you very often find that you have medicinal herbology. Um, and there are all sorts of wonderful names, such as um, green pharmacy or the physic garden. All of these things are actually about medicinal herbology. And so therefore, it's very important to select the courses and understand what the content really looks like. But the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh and Kew both have courses in this area all about botanics, which I think is very interesting. And some of them are distance courses designed for people like us who are working full time and actually aren't able uh, to go through the process of, of sitting through and, and a whole lecture series and a, a long course. Um, the other things that are available um, are really offered by organisations such as the Institute of Brewing and Distilling. And I'm, I'm the incoming president in September of the Institute. And um, the Institute of Brewing and Distilling has some really nice qualifications that start with the fundamentals of distilling, which is for the total novice, you know, what are the basic aspects of, of production of distilled spirits. And then it moves through a series of qualifications, the certificate and the diploma, which I'm currently reviewing for the Institute currently. And, and these are, are in-depth studies of how you manufacture spirits. And they go from raw materials all the way through to distillation and product quality control. So they're really, really quite nice. 
In 2016, the Institute of Brewing and Distilling is launching something called the Master Distiller Program. And I'll come on to a little bit about what that's about in a moment. But I want to also mention Harriet Watt University, who I know have been here on previous years. And they have a, a BSc and an MSc in Brewing and Distilling, which also means they have graduates in Brewing and Distilling, which is also a very important potential source of talent. Um, back to the Master Distiller qualification. So it's five modules, four of which are taught, and they expect you to be able to navigate in depth across the process of distilling. And the fifth module is a case study. So it might be uh, building a new distillery, or extending your distillery, or actually developing a whole new product range, as an example. And that case study, obviously, is, is the final part of your process. Or if you really, really want to study distilling in a deep way, then you can actually do a Master's of Research or a PhD in it. And uh, over, over time, when I was an academic, uh, which is a few years ago now, but when I was an academic, um, I actually had a, a couple of students do PhDs, one, one in um, whiskey and one in sake. So it's absolutely feasible to do a PhD in gin. So I don't know of anyone who has one, so if somebody does, please tell me, I'd love to meet you. Always keen to meet uh, scientists. Um, so, um, the, the key thing about those PhDs is this. This is the main source of novel understanding that underpins the whole process of distilling and also underpins the biology that sits un and the chemistry that sits underneath the raw materials that we use. So even if you don't want to study for a PhD in gin, what you might want to do is keep in touch with the scientific literature. So I showed you a few excerpts of scientific literature that's been published in the last five years. And that full metabolic screen of all of the compounds on a seasonal basis from Juniper was actually in the last uh, 18 months. So the science is moving. It's growing. It's, it's, it's young uh, as sciences go, but it is actually starting. So do, do, do look out for those publications because they will have hidden gems in them that you wouldn't believe. And the other thing is that actually meetings like this are absolutely phenomenal. Um, they really are important for bringing together everyone to be educated in gin. So I, I, I'm, I'm already a fan of the gymposium. I've learned a lot today already. And the second thing is that actually the Institute of Brewing and Distilling has a Distilled Spirits Congress. We asked for permission to put the flyers outside and this is where you can present your findings and where scientists will present their findings on all matters to do with distilled spirits. So please do talk to me about that as well if you want to at lunch. Um, so finally, just to wrap up, um, this gymposium is a brilliant resource and long may it continue. Um, uh, but there are also other things that you can do in order to be able to broaden uh, what it is you know about uh, the, the individual raw materials and the process. Um, it, there are so many different ways in which you can tap into development courses. Please don't think that, that you can't in terms of production. But when it comes to things like um, understanding uh, the flavours associated with these, uh, that's actually a, a real sort of gap. So one of the things I did when I first started this journey in distilled spirits was I undertook the Wine and Spirits Education Trust uh, Award II uh, course and examination. I haven't been in an examination for a very long time, uh, so it felt quite daunting. But actually, it was really brilliant. The only, the only issue is that actually it covers all distilled spirits and not just gin. So actually, the time spent talking about gin is limited. The other thing I would say is that at the Wine and Spirits Education Trust, much as I'm a huge fan, that's the highest level you can go to. And when you're doing the tastings, the scale is continuous across all distilled spirits. So it compares whiskies and brandies and rums with gins and vodkas. And they are actually quite different. So what I would say is that it's an excellent place to start, uh, but perhaps we should really try to lobby for someone to produce uh, courses that are absolutely in this area for gin. And, and that's a personal ask because I will attend and pay as well. Um, so the future of gin is, is dependent on two things in my view. The first thing actually is quality, absolutely paramount. When I compare it to other scenarios where craft segments have set up, quality has been the real stumbling block for the new kids who come into uh, the marketplace. 
So always have that eye on quality. You are the masters of the selection of your raw materials, so create the specifications and really make those work for you in the best way possible. And the other thing really is to look out for sources of talent and new courses that will give you new insights to the work that you do. It's always very useful and it's not too late, I'm living proof, uh, to go and do an examination and learn something new. So thank you so much for this opportunity to speak at this symposium. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. I um, hope you have, actually, since you're the audience. And, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you.